Welcome to this week's Strange Pathways. I am your host, Scott Mort. I uh, I have had the most miserable week. I I've been sick, sick enough to take off work, and that's that's kind of a rarity for me. Uh, but there was an upside to it as well. Uh, I got I got a chance to watch a lot of documentaries on the paranormal that I've I've really really been dying to see. And one of those was a bit of a surprise to me. I was kind of I was kind of watching it just as a just as a goof, really. But I'm really going to suggest everyone watch The Curse of the Man Who Sees UFOs. It's it's a documentary uh centered around a uh, a man in California, Cristo Rapolo. And he sees and videotapes UFOs on a near constant basis. I got to admit, some of them, some of them, it was kind of like, that could just be a plane. Maybe it's just the way the plane is angled. It's flying straight towards him. But then there were a lot, and I mean a lot of footage, that he took that had me stunned. Quite honestly, lights behaving in the sky that just was was honestly breathtaking. And the documentary gets into his personal life. And even though, and I say this with all the love in my heart, even though he seems like he'd be a very exhausting man to spend time with, you can really tell in his heart that this was a good person who I, uh, I empathized with. For a large portion of his life, he's he's really been knocked around. So please, please go watch it. You're going to be you're going to be very pleased with it. Curse of the Man Who Sees UFOs, 2016. Cristo Rapolo is the is the gentleman's name. Fascinating stuff. Our first tale is going to take us all the way back to 1935. We're going to go to Drem, Scotland. Now, Victor Goddard, actually, Sir Victor Goddard, he was a senior commander in the Royal Air Force during the Second World War. Kind of, kind of the contemporary of what my father did, even though my father wasn't a senior commander by any stretch of the imagination. He was a tail gunner in the old Flying Fortresses. Now, Goddard had a lot of strange stuff happen to him. There's actually a, a, a movie based on, on one of the incidents that happened to Goddard. Uh, 1946, uh, he had an incident. The, the 1955 film, The Night My Number Came Up, is based on. In 1935, Goddard was flying to Edinburgh from Andover, England. And he passes over this dilapidated airfield in Drem, Scotland. There was foliage overtaking most of it. Cattle were actually on the airfield eating the vegetation that was overtaking the field. There was a whole lot of nothing going on. So, he reaches Edinburgh, and a few days later, Goddard begins his trip back over Andover. And he takes the same route. Makes sense. He knows the route. Before Goddard gets to Drem, though, he runs into a storm. The storm has torrential rain. It's high wind territory and the storm clouds were yellow yellow clouds very very odd goddard knew this was odd and he gets disoriented loses control of the plane so there's an old joke with pilots you push the stick forward houses get bigger Pull the stick back, houses get smaller. 
if you're trying to regain control of the plane, it's best to have as much distance between you and the ground as you possibly can. So Goddard climbs above the clouds, but they don't seem to end. The end part of that joke, and it's not a very funny joke. The end part of the joke is, if you pull the stick back too fast, the houses get small and then real big, real fast. And that's what Goddard did. His plane begins to fall. But then, the clouds break. That yellowness fades away. Goddard can see the ground again. And he can see over in the distance, there's that airfield. He knows where he is. Almost instantly, the sky turns bright and sunny. The rain stops. No winds. Everything is clear. He looks down at the airfield. It's not overgrown anymore. In fact, it looks pristine. He sees mechanics and they're working on, on planes, Ford planes. Each one of these planes are painted yellow and they're right on the runway. And he, he said, remember, this is 1935. He says, the one plane, I've never seen anything like it. The Royal Air Force has nothing like this monoplane. And the mechanics are wearing blue overalls. Yellow planes, blue overalls. The Royal Air Force mechanics wore brown. There were no yellow planes in the RAF. He didn't think about it too much. He's still shaking off what happened to him. So he passes over the airfield. The storm returns. The bright sunshine fades away. Hard rain. And those yellow clouds, those damn yellow clouds... They get him again. He's, he's just in the fight of his life. He, he's having such a hard time controlling his airplane. But he does. And he's able to land safely at the home base. He tells all of his friends. And all of his friends are extremely skeptical. And you know what? He doesn't really tell it to that many people after that. In 1975, he tells it again. He, he wrote a book called Flight Towards Reality. In 39, what Victor Goddard saw became reality the Royal Air Force starts to paint their training planes yellow. And that weird monoplane? The Magister. They added the Magister to their force. Even the mechanics started wearing blue overalls at that point. And that airfield, that airfield at Drem, that airfield makes a comeback. It's kind of frightening to think that time is not as solid as we give it credit for. I think with a, a lot of peculiar things happening, the Berenstain, Berenstain Bears, for instance, which I don't give a lot of credit to that, but I will go to my grave saying that whenever I was a kid, C-3PO didn't have a silver leg. C-3PO was all gold. There's something strange going on with that. I, I remember Kirk Douglas dying 
way before he did. There is something strange with time. Time is not as solid as we give it credit for. And it's terrifying to think that one day I could be driving down the road and my home doesn't exist anymore. My friends don't know who I am. My wife married to someone else. It's a terrifying thought. Unlikely? Sure. But as you and I dig through these cases, we're starting to learn. Unlikely does not mean impossible. Our next tale is going to take us to Boston. August 14th, 1765. A black cloud, but not a cloud. A black cloud like something that looked like a giant human hovers over Boston, remains there until sunset. Thousands see it. No big deal, right? I mean, people see what they want to see in clouds. At 7 p.m., the cloud lands and quickly rises again, moves south, hovering about 20 feet off the ground, striding down Main Street. It's, it's blowing off little, little vaporous smoke trails and a few rapid sparks of electrical fire. It's a storm cloud, but it's, it's there. It's a human-shaped storm cloud walking down Main Street. And it does so until it comes to the province house. Now it gets to the province house and this cloud thing flops around for a few minutes. It swells and it goes from a gray storm cloud to black. It looks fierce. That's what the newspaper says. This thing looks fierce. And then it shoots off three reports of thunder. The paper itself said that it shook the lofty fabric and all the little houses and hollow hearts did hear it. It shook and tore away a newly erected building said to be for a stamp office. I, I'll be honest, I don't know what a stamp office is. I'm imagining it to be some sort of post office. This Goliath... It's not done. It heads to the direction of Fort Hill and it shatters windows, plates in the home of the governor. It destroys his yard fence and his couch house door. After it's done dealing all this damage, it goes up the mountain comes to a, a, a stop for a few minutes and then it begins to roar, thunder, it vents smoke and fire. The paper once again very eloquently puts it that it raged like Etna in 10,000 flames. This goes on until 11 at night. And then it vanishes. It's quiet. 
15 years later, this thing comes back. A deacon, Daniel Shute, from Byfield, Massachusetts, he records the following events that happened on April 27th, 1778. Yesterday, being the Lord's Day, the first Sunday after Easter, about five of the clock in the p.m., a most terrible, and as most men do conceive, supernatural thing took place. A form of giant, I suppose rather under than over 20 feet high, walked through the air from somewhere nigh the governor's school, where it was first spied by some boys, till it passed the meeting house, where Mr. Whitman who was driving his cows also, which ran violently bellowing. Sundry on the whole road from the meeting house to Deacon Cyril's house saw and heard it, till it vanished from sight nigh Hunslow's hill. As Deacon Cyril saw, it strode so fast as a good horse might gallop, and two or three feet above the ground, and what more than all we admired, it went through walls and fences as one goes through water, yet they were not broken or overthrown. It was black, as it might be dressed in cloth indeed, yet were we so terrified that none observed what manner, if at all, it was habited. It continually made a terrifying scream, hoo hoo, so that some women fainted. Could it have been just a strange weather phenomenon it it doesn't seem so i've said before in my show i i do believe and it's one of my strangest beliefs but i do believe that tornadoes do have some kind of intelligence behind them a sense of humor a grim sense of humor a violent sense of humor is this an example of that as, as I said this, this week, I was sick. You can probably still hear it in my voice. I'm fighting off a, a cough right now. Excuse me. <coughs> I'm leaving that in. <coughs> <coughs> I am sick. So I'm going to leave that in. But I, I watched a lot of paranormal documentaries. I, I watched uh, one about Skinwalker Ranch. I watched one about the Bennington Triangle. Watched another about the Bridgewater Triangle. And there was, there was two things that, that hit me hard. Number one, nothing wonderful really happens. Right? Every, every once in a great while... There's, there's something nice that happens. Somebody's mother comes and visits them after she dies and, and lets them know that she's okay. Or you know, a, a ghost comes through or a UFO cures, cures somebody of their cancer or, or like a Bigfoot leads somebody to a treasure. I don't remember that ever happening. I'm just giving examples. But by and far, most of these cases are negative, are very negative. Keep that in mind. Number two, the Bennington Triangle, Bridgewater Triangle, Skinwalker Ranch. Each of these locations had paranormal activity happening within a certain border. And then... As time went on, that activity goes across that border. Right now, Skinwalker Ranch, people who live near it, who've never experienced anything paranormal, they're having incidents happen in their home now. And it occurred to me that I believe we may be at war and we don't know it. 
we might be at war with the paranormal. It's nothing good. It can't be anything good. If something comes down and experiments on my children, takes them out of the house at night, if something writes, get out in blood on the walls, if something is ripping my cattle apart in seconds and leaving not a drop of blood, I'm going to venture a guess and say, whatever this is does not have my best interests at heart. And if it's true that the Skinwalker Ranch phenomenon is growing, that the Bridgewater Triangle phenomenon is growing, that the Bennington Triangle phenomenon is growing, then that really seems to me like we're losing ground in a war. Let's go to our last tale. We're going to go all the way back to November of 1906. There are these two little boys. They're living in Baltimore. Nine, seven years old. Clarence and Charles Laguerre. They're perfectly normal. They're healthy. Just like me. And I'm willing to bet a lot of you listening... They loved to explore, right? I remember crawling underneath my my house whenever I was a kid. I remember going deep into the woods, crawling under tree roots, even once or twice finding a cave and crawling into that. And they were, they were just like us. And one place that they wanted to explore was just a few blocks from their home, the Baldwin House. It was a deserted mansion on 28th Street in Baltimore. And everybody had a story about it being haunted. Like some of the neighbors, they, they would hear like groans, moans, screams from the inside. They'd see lights flickering in the windows of this abandoned mansion. Some people even saw a strange, deformed creature that would be seen sitting at an upstairs window. Now, Clarence and Charles Laguerre, they wanted to get inside of this old building, look around, sneak a little bit, explore, have an adventure. They go inside, and they, they rush out just a few moments later. They, they have this, this terrified look, and they couldn't even say what they'd seen. They made odd, guttural sounds. No one... Could get through to them. The children could not say a word. Their friends, their friends freaked out. They ran away. They left the kids there. They didn't even take them home. They left them there. And these kids, Charles, Clarence, they they find their way home. They go up to their mother. And the mother just has a hard time comprehending what she's seeing. She almost faints. They bring the doctors in. They look at Charles. They look at Clarence. The doctors are baffled. The only only theory is 
that Charles and Clarence saw something inside the house that scared them so bad, it drove the two boys to insanity. For months. Mrs. Laguerre took Charles and Clarence from hospital to hospital, to institution to institution, to doctor to doctor, trying to find a cure. There was no avail. These boys were mild-mannered. They were good kids. They became horrors. Charles would break and smash everything he could get his hands on. Clarence ran away at every, every opportunity that was granted to him. He was trying to get back to the Baldwin Mansion. Mr. and Mrs. Laguerre sold their home. They purchased a cottage on Merriman Lane, just down the street from John Hopkins University. The local authorities and public health officials had to step in. They told the Laguerres, surround your house with barbed wire to prevent these children from escaping. And it worked for a little while until the brothers escaped by burrowing under the fence. And where would the boys go? Back to the Baldwin Mansion on 28th Street. Time after time, escape after escape, right back to the Baldwin Mansion. Remember that, right back to the Baldwin Mansion. Their authorities, they shackled steel weights to their ankles. The boy's parents, and this is heartbreaking, the boy's parents built a barbed wire cage in the backyard. That was their home. A barbed wire cage in the backyard. Charles, the younger one, he was, he was the more vicious. He would hurl rocks, bottles, anything he could get his hands on. He would, he would throw at people who passed by his home. In a direct quote from the San Francisco Examiner, he will climb to the top of the cage and pull his shirt and trousers to rags, using the barbed wire prongs to tear his clothing and unmindful when the blood streams from his little legs. The, when his passion has subsided, he will come back to the earth bottom of the cage and play with his brother. Seemingly forgetful of the harm he has accomplished and the sores and scratches he has put all over his little body. I know I said the. I believe me. I recognize it's then. I'm editing this uh, San Francisco Examiner article because, quite honestly, there's some some language that we would consider harmful and hurtful these days. Be mindful of that. Finally, the Baltimore Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children gets involved. And they come over and they look at this and they realize, oh my God. This is all that can be done. This is not a cruelty. This is a kindness that looks cruel. None of the sanitariums had had the facilities to hold them. The local laws that said you couldn't put children in jail. Summer is giving way to fall. The weather's turning colder. And the parents are worried because the boys are too violent to be allowed back inside the house.
the only thing Mrs. Laguerre could wrap her mind around was that something supernatural happened to her boys, demonic possession, something, something along those lines. In her own words, they were as healthy as I am. And after they came home from that house on 28th Street, they were like this. People always said that house was haunted, and I never believed it. But at nights now, when I sit in my room and look over the hills and note its location, when the moans from one of the boys comes to me, I know I believe in the witchcraft of the house. And then, for a moment, nothing can dissuade me that the house is possessed of evil spirits and ghosts. The mother, Martha Laguerre, November of 1907, gets divorced from her husband, Charles. And she's, she's awarded custody of Charles, Clarence, and two other children. The stress had been too much. Martha's husband, Charles, abused, mistreated. The entire family. I did some digging. I tried to find out what happened to any of them. And thankfully, in 1909, Martha Laguerre ends up marrying a man named Kolb and moves away to Tosin. And the story of the children just ends. I, I, found, I found Charles and Clarence on Ancestry.com. There's no death date. Either these children were relieved of whatever the malady was, or Kolb must have been one, one amazing man. But remember, I told you to note that the children always tried to return to the Baldwin Mansion. It it seems to me that something attached itself to these two children. But it needed that mansion to survive. You have ghosts, but ghosts are often seen in just one place. So maybe in this case, they knew that their time was limited if they didn't get back to the mansion. Maybe these two boys are innocent bystanders in our unknown war with the paranormal. Maybe that's what the men in black are. Maybe the men in black are here to quiet down evidence of the war that we're at. Thank you for joining us this week on Strange Pathways. Please come on over to our Facebook page. I'm going to have I'm going to have a fair amount of images dealing with this week's tales. If you'd like to get a hold of me, you can do so at strangepathwaysmail at gmail.com. Tell a friend. Tell a family member, you know you've got someone in your life that's going to love stories like this. I've seen, I've seen so many people on, on so many forums out there mention the show. Thank you so, so very much. Let more people know. The more people that know, the more this show can grow. The more this show can grow, the more episodes that I can put out. I would love to start doing episodes multiple times a week. 
once again. Thank you so much for joining me this week. Take care of yourselves and each other. <laughs>